Hari Om Pranam. I am really very happy to welcome everyone. So this is the first night of this four nights Yajna on chapter 14 of our sacred text, Srimad Bhagavad Gita. Every year we engage members of the Chinmaya family as we celebrate Gurudev Jayanti. Today marks the 103rd birth anniversary of our beloved Gurudev. We are very honored to have with us this evening the head of Chima Mission Trinidad and Tobago and the principal of Chinmaya Vidyalaya, Puja Swami Prakashananda. Very special welcome. So, President of Chima Mission, in the person of Sri Vipal Rambi Hariji, members of the executive. Special welcome also to all very near and dear Brahmacharis and Brahmachari, Brahmacharinis of CM Trinidad. So, very dedicated, so very committed, and hard working members of staff, so all parents, so all students. To members of the Chimaya Mission family, to the listening audience on Akash Valley 106.5 FM, and to all other distinguished individuals, our heart to pronounce and a special welcome. Indeed, we are very happy to have all of you here this night. Swami Shivananda, 
who blessed him with the name Chinmayananda, which means filled with the bliss of pure consciousness. Swami Shivananda then guided Swami Chinmayananda to the most renowned Vedanta master of the time, our Param Guru, Swami Tapovanji, who resided in Uttar Kashi. As Swami Tapovanji is disciple, the young Swami Chinmayananda led an austere life and underwent an intense study of Vedantic literature. Upon completion of his period and sadhana, Swami Chinmayananda sought his Buddha's blessings to spread Vedantic knowledge that had brought fulfillment in his own life to the masses. He conducted his first Jnana Yajna in December 1951 at a small temple in Pune that had lasted 100 days. In 1964, Guru Dev rationalized that he should take the wisdom of the Himalayan kings to foreign countries when he indicated, quote, purely in a gush of love, I am coming to the West for the joy of communication with similar hearts seeking peace and fulfillment in life, unquote. Sunday night, May 1965, was extremely significant for the people of Trinidad and Tobago, since hundreds gathered at Biapu International Airport to welcome the arrival of the realized master and leading exponent of the Hindu Shastras, Gurudev Swami Chinmayananda His teachings were based on the authority of the Vedas and his direct experience. The discourses he gave from platforms throughout India and around the world were dynamic, logical, and witty. Hundreds of thousands came to listen and live. By the time he left his mortal coil in 1993, he would have touched and transformed the lives of millions of sadhakas or seekers across the globe. Pujay Guruji, Swami Tejamayananda Ji wrote, We are deeply indebted to Swami Chimayananda. There is absolutely no doubt that he was a great rishi of modern times and an extraordinary visionary. The sages of the Upanishad pray, quote, May those Brahmacharis who want to revel in Brahman come to us from all directions." Unquote. They wanted pupils who had the skin of mind and body to come to them, and many came. Swami Chalmayananda added renewed vigor to this tradition by setting up Sandeepani Sagaralayas in Mumbai, Siddhavani, Andhra Pradesh, Karnataka, and Kerala, where Brahmacharis and Brahmacharinis are given training. Young educated people between the ages of 18 to 30 are invited to these institutions and trained free of cost. He wanted them to learn the scriptures so that they would be able to live more complete and fulfilling lives. In ancient times, students of Gurukulas had to go out every day to collect arms, which were in turn offered to the Guru. The Guru would then give the disciple his share. There were times when he would decide not to give them anything in order to increase the level of austerity of the student. In the Sandeepanese, because of his tremendous compassion, Swami Chinmayananda Ji ensured that the students did not have to go out for anything. He made certain that all the needs of his disciples were automatically met. His one desire was that students who came to him to study Vedanta should do so without any other concern. Swami Chinmayananda took it upon himself to feed, clothe, house, and nourish all those who showed an interest in Vedanta. Notwithstanding all this, the students on completion of their studies were under no obligation to work for the Chimaya mission. Even after giving so much, he had no expectations of any kind from anyone. Once a Brahmachari asked him, Murali, what do you expect from us? Swami Chimayananda replied, nothing, just smile when we meet. In his scheme of things, there was no question of a bond being inside. He had no expectations whatsoever from his students. His only aim was to give them this knowledge so that they could be free. To work or not to work for the mission was the choice of the students. As far as Gurudev was concerned, there were no hard feelings. It is indeed difficult to find such a large-hearted Rishi as our beloved Gurudev. Our principal and Acharya of Chinmaya Mission in Trinidad, Swami Prakashan Ji, had the great fortune of studying under the greatest teacher of the 20th century, Swami Chinmaya Ji. Indeed, we are all blessed to sit at Swamiji's feet tonight to imbibe the wisdom of our Srimad Bhagavad Gita, presented with eloquence, clarity, and wit by Swami Prakash Ji. Thank you, Hari. Thank you very much, Acharya. Let me invite you to the stage now, the President of Chinmaya Mission, Chinmaya Tabigo. 
and uh, accompany him would be a very own public necessity, like you know, here and now. Akanda mandala karam vyaptam yena chara charam tat param narshitam yena tasme shri gurave namaha agnyana timirangasya jnana jana shakaya chakshurun yeritam yena tasme shri gurave namaha Guru Brahma, Guru Vishnu, Guru Devo Maheshwara, Guru Eva Param Brahma, Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha. Hinduism. 
अनुवाद चीज मैं पाएगा अनुभव दातो सिद्धान ही दात ही हत्ता रहे जो मैंने लेक्चर्स यर्नेस एंड राइटिंग्स लेटर्स एंड बाय डायरेक्ट कम्युनिकेशन विद वेरियस पीपल एस वेल टू सपोर्टेड हिम इन दिस मिशन he simplified his lectures through the BMI chart as he heard the professor yesterday speaking and emphasizing on that. The open arts question is, who am I? And Gurudev lectures and lessons and teaching centers around this. And I recall in one of his lectures, he said, we do not listen with our ears. Is that true? <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking about when I heard that. But then he explained, we listen through our ears. But, but by that consciousness that pervades and permeates us all. And that consciousness that enlivens all our functioning and all that we do. And Gurudev centers his teaching and encapsulated his lessons in this very word that we are not this body, we are not this mind, and we are not the intellect. We are the, that supreme consciousness, that reality, which causes the function and in living us. So, in short, in various ways, Gurudev, through various texts, more so the Bhagavad Gita, he emphasized this. And to become more Hindu is to understand and realize this message. But I am the supreme consciousness dwelling in the world. Hariyo, Jai Guruji. Thank you very much, Sri Uplal Nami Haraji. One of the most productive contributors to this ashram and the school, one of the most effective individuals. I mean, I have been the president of Chema Mission since Chema Mission started here in Trinidad in the year 1997. That happened with the return of our beloved Pujas Swami Tukashananda to the land of his birth, sweet Trinidad and Tobago. And he come because he was posted here by our beloved Gurudev to come and share the wisdom of the Rishis with our citizens. And so under his leadership, under the leadership of our beloved Buddha Swami Kashanandi, Chimam Mishan Trinidad was born. But then things changed with the passage of time, the growth of the mission. And our Puja Swamiji would have recognized significant deficiencies in our public education system. A system which continued to contribute to low academic achievement amongst students. Excessive high rates of school dropouts. Increase in the use of drugs. 
increase in the number of teenage pregnancy, increase in bullying, and school violence. As a direct result of this failure in the public education system, accompanied by high rates of teacher absenteeism, a significant number of our students would leave the education system illiterate. It is against this background that this country witnessed the birth of Chinmaya Vidyalaya in 2003. Under the guidance of Puja Swamiji, the Vidyalaya flourished. And today, it has become a meaningful partner in the educational landscape of this nation, impacting the lives not only of our students, but parents, grandparents, and members of the extended families. Today, the, the Vidyalaya would have distinguished itself as a very high-performing educational institution as a result of several factors. Our unique methodologies, our high levels of discipline. We have zero school violence here, and we also have a very hard working and committed staff. We also have a very involved, very co cooperative, and very supportive parent body who have chosen to send their children. <coughs> to this institution. Chiman Mission would have expanded its horizons significantly due to Swamiji's unwavering devotion, his dynamism, his humility, his selfless disposition, his charisma, and the tremendous amount of enthusiasm that he displays on a daily basis. Thousands of lives have been transformed as a result of Swamiji's guidance over the years. Now, we will have some of our students who have been taught this verses from Srimad Bhagavad Gita together with Gita Gyan. They will present both pieces. We begin with Gita Gyan.
Thank you very much. So we will be reciting these verses together with Gita Dhyana on all four nights of this year. At this time I hand you over to what you just want me to.
Ramara, Ramara, the day that the day means. Uttering and chanting the name of Ram, Bidio Maria. Her whole life went away. Who? Dilni. Dilni means Shabari. Shabari was called Dilni because she was born in a hill clan, hill tribe. And so she sat there wondering, Rahukula Nandana, Gau Aavoge, when did that Ram come? And her whole life went like that. In one thing only, chanting the name of Ram and thinking when he will come. And today, after 30,000 years, we, are still, we still sing the praises of Shabari. Because she did that one little, what we consider to be little. In fact, we consider it to be nothing. And when we die, next day everybody forget. 30,000 years ago, we, we still remember Shabari. When we go, nobody remember. People ask if you are well, living, they say, I'm living right here. Correct or not? Alright, I'll tell you the full meaning. And one of the other, Deva. And we'll we sing it. It's a very, very famous version. This ashram got off the ground by the donation, selfless donation of her. Amma, who worked her life in the cane fields and gave her life savings to start this ashram. She used to sing this bhajan. I remember her also, Mrs. Bola.
through speech. Like we have professors and teachers in the classroom and they teach by words. So teach by example, teach by words. And when we teach by words, when we speak and we are trying to teach something, we can tell that thing directly or we can tell that thing by the use of a story or an anecdote or an example or we can have a combination of both of them and the stories which we tell the stories which we devise and the examples and the anecdotes and all of those things they also are devised tailored to meet the different types of audience which we are teaching. You know, you cannot take a professor who teaches thermodynamics in university to come and teach thermodynamics to the preschool. Even when the children hear the word thermodynamics, all of them will run away. Isn't it? So if a professor from the university is coming to teach, to say something to the children in the preschool, right? What he has to tell. He cannot tell about thermodynamics and all, isn't it? He has to tell some story in which some lesson or some moral or something will be found to appeal to these children. Correct or not? So in our teaching, we teach sometimes like I told you, directly. We tell the thing as it is. Tell something, like for example, the little boy went to his father and he said, Dad, how does it rain? The father said, well, you see sun, like this. When the sun shines, it releases this kinetic energy, you know? That energy comes into the surface layers of the water, of the ocean. And when those surface layers of the water develop enough, potential energy, that potential energy gets converted to kinetic energy and they fly up into the atmosphere, water molecules, and they form clouds, they precipitate the clouds, and then there's condensation, and then there's the falling of rain, like all that kind of word he the father is using, right? A little five-year-old now. He, he gone by the grandmother. That's magic. He said, Aji, I asked Daddy why it rains, how it rains. And he tells me about precipitation and all kind of condensation and things. Aji said, Beta, let me tell you the truth. Your father does not know anything. <laughs> now see, the father was talking directly as the thing happens, right? But for a child, that thing is not going to make any, any sense whatsoever. So the Aji said, well, I tell you why it rains. You see, in the sky, there lives a king. When he hears a story like that, that's a fantastic story out of this world, literally. <laughs> so he likes to do that. Guy lives a king in a big palace. And that king has a little son just like you. That make him listen even more, no? Like me, yes. Ah, that little boy like you is called a prince and he gets whatever he wants, you know. And his father built him a nice swimming pool in the backyard. This guy also a backyard, eh? <laughs> no, no, he ain't questioning, he not questioning any of these things because the story is a fantastic story, right? That captivates his mind. We're not questioning anything. The captivation of the mind is what is important here. So the, the little boy has a swimming pool in the backyard and there he has a baby elephant as his toy, as his pet. And a big ball like that. And the baby elephant takes water from the swimming pool and sprays on this boy when he throws the ball like that. And he introduces that ball and the elephant now the Aji. 
Aji introduced all of this. And when the elephant sprays water on the little boy like this, it falls down here and we get rain. That little boy says, I know daddy was crazy. <laughs> The idea is, even though he was telling it exactly as it is, that makes no sense to the little boy. And the fantastic story which is told because of his mental development, the level of his mental development is such that a fantastic story, fantastic story, you know, fantasy, eh? fantastic which is concocted and told to him, he says, yes, and that is crazy. So we utilize all the various methods of teaching. At that stage, it is important to captivate the mind of the child, to keep the child from going astray. We have, to, we have to captivate the minds of the children. And in captivating the minds of Hindus, the scriptures have done a fantastic job. Keep, keeping the mind centered on so many countless, we will not find more stories anywhere in our Mahabharata and Purana. So many countless stories in our there, and all of them will have some morals, some teachings, some message behind them also. But really speaking, when it comes to the description of reality as it is, describing reality as it is, the structure and nature of the universe in which we live, that is a different matter altogether. And that is dealt with in the Upanishads and in the Bhagavad Gita. The Bhagavad Gita is a summation, it is the essence of all the Upanishads. So the stories and all the other things is one thing, and that is one method of teaching. But the Upanishads deal with a different subject matter altogether. That is like the father telling about precipitation and condensation, which is actually the fact. But the boy is not ready to, to receive it, and prepare for that. In the last 22 years, which is just about this time, 22 years, the mission has been here, in India. the mission has been making a very, very concerted effort with the help of so many people to deal with this subject matter of the Upanishads, the Bhagavad Gita, and the teaching in a direct fashion. Not that we don't do the other things as well, but we have also been trying to introduce this method of direct teaching of the Upanishads and all of that. And this chapter which we have chosen this year, chapter 14, falls in the last one third of Bhagavad Gita. Bhagavad Gita is divided into three portions. The last portion of six chapters from 13 to 18 deals with this very, very important topic of Jnana. The first six chapters deal with Karma, next six chapters with Bhakti, and the last six chapters with Jnana. So the chapter which we have chosen this year is chapter 14, which falls in the Jnana portion. Knowledge portion. Knowledge portion means the knowledge which is taught directly, now, without beating around the bush, and taught in a very logical and rational fashion. And that means also that you will have to now we say in Trinidad language, you bust your brain a little bit. You know, bust your brain means don't worry. Nothing will <laughs> nothing will crack more than it already is. <laughs> it means we have to apply the rational faculty in understanding what is being taught in chapter 14. Of course, we have to apply rational faculty understanding what is being taught in the entire Bhagavad Gita, but now in a more direct fashion. This 14th chapter springs from a verse which is there in the 13th chapter. Yavatsanjayate kimchit sattvam sthavara jangamam 
क्षेत्र क्षेत्र
क्षेत्र अनुक्षेत्र दीज टू थिंग्स कम टूगेदर नाउ एंड यूनिवर्स इज बॉर्न सो दे यू सी एवरीथिंग इन यूनिवर्स वाइल एट द सेम टाइम इट माइट बी हैविंग एन इनर्ट एस्पेक्ट ऑफ इट लाइक फॉर एग्जांपल दिस थिंग राइट यू पुट इट ऑन हियर इट इज जस्ट अ डेड इनर्ट राइट सिटिंग देयर डज नथिंग नॉट मूविंग वेयर दैट इज ओनली फ्रॉम वन पार्टिकुलर That way, it has another aspect of it. It has another side which we don't see with our eyes. So everything in the universe is made up of the, the jada aspect and the other side which we don't see with our eyes. This thing is moving in five different directions right now. This microphone, but you don't know. Five different directions is moving. See one one direction. I tell you, look here. This earth is turning on its own axis. Correct. This is sitting on the earth, right? And this earth is turning on its own axis. <coughs> so this is turning or not? That is one. The earth is not only turning on its own axis. The earth is also tilting slowly. How many degrees it does that? Back and forth. Fifteen degrees, twenty degrees, something. There is another direction. This thing is moving also. The Earth is also moving around the Sun, not only turning on its own axis right there, but also while it's doing that, it's also moving around the Sun. So there are like, like three directions already. So this thing moving now or not? But just now you told me it was not moving. But it's moving. So we see with our eyes one thing. But with our understanding, we come to discover other things. Then all the atoms and everything inside of it, electrons. No electrons is quietly. Then moving with lightning speeds. Every electron in this. And then our entire Earth. Our solar system belongs to a bigger Milky Way, and in that Milky Way we are moving. That's five already. If I'm more, so there is the element of inertia, stillness, stationary, but there, there is the element of life behind it. But not moving in any chaotic manner. They are moving in a very neat fashion. They're moving in a very ordered fashion. You see, as though there's some controller out there. You cannot, the, the, the electron cannot say, "Okay, I escape this atom." He doesn't have the choice. If somebody is, there's a controller. Anu manta in the thirteen chapter is called. So. Everything in the universe is made up of these two. So one is called a kshetra, the other is called a kshetra nyan. In this chapter now, one will be called as Mahat Brahma of Prakriti, and the other will be called as the Lord. It's just a different name, Prakriti. Right? Now, which is what is going to happen in this 13th and 14th chapter? Now, one more thing. Very very interesting thing. Everybody, every human being, if he, even if he is not taught shastra, scriptures, he is not taught, and he is not gone to school and he has not learned anything. He always wants to know the origin of things around him. Correct or not? We always want to know where this thing came from. How did? I remember my children. They, a, a, a new baby came next door. Then we ask Nani next morning. We hear baby crying next door. Huh? Where baby came from? Nani said, "Well, last night when all of them sleeping, a plane land down in the yard and bring a baby." And that, as children, that was enough for me. Right? That was enough for me too. Wait, wait, wait! What is the origin of things? Isn't it? You know. 
if you belong to my age group and you didn't open a radio and a TV to see who it is back then, <laughs> well, you are doing nothing. <laughs> my, I opened that TV and looked in the CRT in back there or everywhere. They have one day. You want to know all, isn't it? And the radio also. Nowadays, youngsters don't have no kind of fun, you know. I don't know what type of fun youngsters have today. The cell phone for long and break by an next one. I didn't know this one. But anyway, I couldn't find the man in the back of the TV. And I also wonder how he gets so small to fit inside it. Anyway, you, we want to know, we want to know about things, we want to know the origin of things. And so human species has always wondered and given wondered about and given thought to the origin of this universe. And of course, we have come up with all sorts of theories and all that, right? And many of the theories are in the form of stories which of course have no logic and rationality, like the little boy, like the Angie telling the little boy about how rain does fall. There are no rationality and no logic or nothing behind it, but the little boy accepts and the little boy says yes, and he believes and he says, my father crazy. Right? Many of the theories of creation and all have, how this universe came and all have all of this sort of fantastic things about them and has no rationality at all. But so let me just tell you some of these people because this 14th chapter is going to tell about this universe, uh, the nature of this universe and how it is and all that. There is a modern theory which is going around now you will see on many of the uh, television stations and what we call as documentaries. They say that the species here, human beings, we, we are aliens, we came from another planet. But that doesn't answer the question. <laughs> <laughs> we came from another planet. But then how did we end up there in that planet? So that doesn't answer the question, isn't it? Uh, so that is just one, one of the theories which is floating around nowadays. So. Then, uh, many of the scriptures of the world tell, tell that the Lord was there all alone one day, right? He was there all alone. And, well, the proper explanation is not given, but he said, suddenly he decided. We don't know why he decided. Or, suddenly he decided that let me create this world and let me make human beings and all of that sort of thing, right? So he decided. So this is called the creation theory. And it, this is also just a big, nice story like the, like the, uh, the boy and the elephant in the sky, right? It's exactly the same thing. Because this creation theory cannot hold what the <laughs> Creation theory cannot hold no water. Is that, there are too many problems with it. I, I'll just give you some. Let's see the creation theory, and I'll just tell you some of the problems associated with this creation theory. Because I told you this chapter and this portion of the scripture is about think you have to think. Did not run one bambas or anything like this? There is a different thing, a different place, and a different method, and a different purpose, and all that. That has its own value, its own place. This is about thinking, right? In the scriptures it says, yad yad karoti kinchit tat tat kamasya cheshita that any action, any action which is done, that action has to have a desire. Because if you don't have a desire, you will not do anything, isn't it? So, human beings, you and I, we have desire because we feel ourselves to be limited. We feel ourselves to be restricted. We feel ourselves to be lacking something. And therefore we have desires. So if a person who feels himself to be complete, a 
person feels himself to be full, total. A person feels that he is not lacking any, he will have any desire. You think that? Huh? One who is totally contented, totally complete, full. They call Purna. And he is, he knows that he is infinite and all that. he feels himself finite, limited, then he will start, oh, I have to get this thing to make me complete. I have to get that thing to make me complete. Because the desire comes now, isn't it? They call desire. I have to get, if I don't get this, I will be complete. If I don't get that, I will be complete. We have, we go on desire. So the human being has desire because of his incompleteness. Because of its limitations. But now, see, just imagine now, according to the creation theory, God alone was there. He alone. Eh? Now, in order to create some desire has to come. And I just told, <laughs> if that, that desire comes in a being who is not complete. Correct? If I a being is complete, what do you desire? The one who is full and complete and contented. What he did that? So you have to say now, God was not full, not complete, not contented. Something like that, you have to pose it now. You're not contented, maybe. Or, if you don't pose this, that you say, well, God alone was there, and poor fellow, he was lonely. He was lonely. Therefore, let me, let me create some people so I will have somebody to play with, you know. <laughs> So now you have to pose it all sorts of limitations on God. Superimposed limitations on God. It means to say either God was uh, incomplete, either God was lonely, either God was bored, or God was discontented. But if you are going to say all of this, that God just like me. So you want to pray to a God just like you? I am praying to no such God. So you will have to first identify the cause in the mind of God and anything you posit, anything you propose as the cause in the mind of God for creating this world, you will real trouble. You try. When you have stay time, you think about this. So this is one thing. You will have to put something in the mind of God. No, no, say, they will say, no, 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 out of love, yeah, listen to this one, out of love and great exuberance, in a, in a flutter of inspiration, God created the world. So what happened before that, didn't he? <laughs> Where does suddenly come from? What happened to the love before? He didn't rush. An exuberant of that. No, no, Swami, that was dormant. So in God, some things has got dormant and some things has come. So God has bad days and good days too. You, you see, anything you would tell to justify this creation, you are for some trouble. So this is just at an ordinary level. Let me, let me tell you at a deeper level, no, the whole idea of creation itself is so illogical, right? Look here, I'll show you. I, I, this, is a, this is a good thing, because this thing is going to come to all the people of Trinidad to go, and this, stuff, this has nothing to do with religion, eh? This has to do with rational thinking, whatever religion you belong to, and if you're listening to this thing, you please think. Think, right? We say, God created the world. Listen to this. Eh? Every act must happen within time. Why? Because an act, the, the definition of an act necessitates that an act begins at a particular time and ends at a particular time. That is what we call an act. An act is, is delineated by a beginning and an end. It must start at some time and end. That's called act. So the act 
act of creation has to have been done. It has to start at a particular time and end at a particular time. The act of creation. So if the act of creation has to start at a particular time and end at a particular time, it means time has to be pre-existing. So who created time now? Because the first thing, when did God create time? God created, I mean, when did God create the world? At a particular time. Oh, that means time was existing. But we know, as we know, all of us here, and even science tells, time is part of the world. Time and space are part of the world. So if you could have created the world, which is an act, that act requires time to be pre existing. Because the act can only happen in, in time. Oh. No, 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 no. Okay. He created time first. <laughs> then we ask, what, what time? <laughs> he created time first. You see, totally logical, this whole idea of creation. Therefore, the Rishis of the Upanishads rejected this thing. Veda, the Upanishads, wholly, totally reject creation. That's what pure rational thought. When, when you, when the child hears what the grandmother tells the story, that time the child thinks the father is crazy. But who is telling the truth between the two of them? The father is telling the truth. The grandmother and Nani actually make up a whole story for him. But look here, who the child believes? Child believes Aji. Think father is crazy. And do you know belief, though it is required at a certain stage in the development of an individual, belief is the greatest danger to a son. The greatest danger to a spiritual aspirant. And I'll give you an example. When a person is sick, a nail stick him in the, in the foot, and he is at a risk of developing blood poison or whatever you call it. That time, tetanus injection is critical for that person, correct? You have to give him tetanus or whatever. But you can't hold a good man on the street and give him tetanus for no reason. You can't give a healthy person medicine for no reason. You will kill him. Correct or not? When the person is sick, the medicine is of critical importance. But once that person is well, the medicine is a danger to the person, correct or not? In the very same way, belief is critical in, a, in the development of an individual. But once that individual has intellectually matured, belief becomes his greatest stumbling block in spiritual development. That is what our project is to say. Don't believe this Swami. Whatever the Swami says, you believe. That's because you're wearing orange clothes and a long beard. The longer the beard, the greater the suspicion. <laughs> think! He used to say, like that. You have to think, right? Rational, logical. What? You subscribe to some belief. And it is good for your development at a certain stage in your life. But you're going to hold on to that childish, pure belief all your life? Belief for a man living in a moral, rational society is nothing more than superstition. Belief is a fancy word for superstition.
So the machine is rejecting this thing that rationally doesn't hold any water at all at all. Or what is the creation? And what is the, what then is proposed by the machines? No creation. The world is as it is and has always been like that. It just keeps going into two states. One state is called as manifest. The other state is called as unmanifest, which you see very, very clearly all around you. In, 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 in the Sanskrit words, we say when you go, it goes to the paralyzed, unmanifest. And that same thing which has gone into an unmanifest state, not destroy them. And Lord Shiva, you have to destroy them, you have to stop using these words. Isn't it? Brahma, Vishnu, Mahesh is a creator, sustainer, and destroyer. Those are wrong words you have been taught by outsiders to Hinduism. Brahmaji, Srishtikar, is the manifester of the universe. He brings things from a state of unmanifest, things that are already there in unmanifest, he brings it into manifest. Lord Vishnu sustains, that is okay. And Lord Shiva dissolves, he sends it back into. When you dissolve sugar in water, you don't destroy sugar. You just send it from a state of manifest to a state of unmanifest. While you were seeing it before, now you can't see it. But it is very much. There, that is the meaning of unmanifest. These are technical words in Vedanta Sanskrit. Vyakta, Vyakta. Avyakta, Vyakta, Sarve. Bhagavan says in that chapter. From the unmanifest, I bring all things into manifest. And they stay for a while. All of us here, we are manifest now. You think you will be manifest forever? No, pretty soon. And many people waiting also. Many people waiting for you to go in out of unmanifest, isn't it? Of course, they don't call it on manifest, they call it kick the bucket. <laughs> well, we are Brahmacharya in Mumbai. Very bad teaching. He used to put a bucket by one Brahmachari door. <laughs> when he get up in the morning, he kicked the bucket. <laughs> I'm saying very bad teaching. I may have also done that. <laughs> Anyway, so we go, the whole universe goes from unmanifest to manifest, and then unmanifest again, and then manifest again. And this is what we call as a cycle. And you see that? No. We have long mango, you know? Long mango. We train that have a lot of long mango and do some calabash and all that. So now, the long mango tree, which is outside the head, which is giving long mango today. Do you think that tree was there 1,000 years ago? No, that tree came recently. Isn't it? Tree, the mango trees don't last that long. 1,000 years ago. So, what happened is, that tree which was there 1,000 years ago, that tree became unmanifest and went into a seed form. And you take that seed and then you plant it, and you get, again you get a manifest tree. And then that tree will die and go into a seed. And that's it. And, then, uh, and thousand years ago, that's how we have long mango today. That's why you could never say which comes first, the chicken or the the egg. Because in in Vedanta Upanishad, this process is anadi. Anadi means beginningless. So because you live in a restricted dimension of beginning and end, you think everything has beginning and an end. In other words, you know at one time this virtue was not there, then it came into being, and then at one time it will not be there again at, at some other time, right? So you think that also the universe is like that. In other words, you put the origin of a thing as the first instance of that thing. No. This kerchief, before it is made, has to be in the mind of the person who made it. Correct or not? It has to be in his mind. That is called the manifest. Anything which is made, it first has to be in the mind of the, the maker. So if it is here already, if it, He's not making it. That's why it is wrong to say that somebody invented anything. We discovered. 
Naik like menjadi kan air ya. Oh, air sakit. Di air itu orang lagi je. Ini sakit chapter this is discuss. Nah, sesuatu bijak dia bahawa, nah bahawa bijak dia sesuatu. Ha, bukan yang orang bijak pun, tapi orang yang orang itu bijak. So this type of idea, the universe is complete, total, full. Everything is already there. Things are just coming into manifest and go, going already into and manifest and again to come back. So don't worry, the dinosaurs will come back. <laughs> or they might be unmanifest here on this earth, but there's many countless worlds and planets everywhere. They might be manifest there. And right now, we are fighting so much to try to save this planet. And, and just yesterday, scientists from around the world, more than a hundred world-class scientists, have declared to the world that in a few years, we are going to put one million species out of existence. They will be extinct. That's how bad we are dealing with this world. So, in Vedanta, we say, that is very bad because when we do that, when we put them out of existence, we put our self out of existence. But the other thing is, if all these species will just go into unmanifest, in the Nata, they'll be destroyed. So the idea of creation is not there in the Upanishads, the idea of a, a beginningless universe, an endless universe. So if you cannot, if your intellect does not allow you the privilege of thinking in terms of beginninglessness, that is not a defect of the theory. That is a defect of your intellect. You understand? Beginningless. The universe has always been there. You go back 10,000 million years, 10 billion years, 10 trillion years, whatever you go back, the universe is, it was there in various forms. You know, it keeps changing. It really keeps changing. New things are coming, old things are going into unmanifest. And like that, on and on, it's a constant eternal flux. This is the idea in the Upanishad. Huh? Any other idea you proceed, you just tell me, and I will show you. It is rigged with contradictions. Hmm? No. This idea is the basis for this chapter. 14. That is one thing, eh? how this universe is, how it exists. Second thing, in the universe, we have something called Nitya. Nitya is made up of three gunas. Sattva, Rajas and Tamas. These three gunas we know very well, you will see when we get there. Especially the last one. We know Tamas very well. So, these three gunas are also dealt with in Diti and how they contribute to our bondage in this chapter. And these are the two main things. Now let us start. In the beginning, Sri Bhagavan Vacha, verse number one, I will chant. You try to repeat those lines. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare
Pranyanam, Jnanam, Jnanam, Prakshyami, Uyami. To say once more time, I'm going to tell you this supreme knowledge, my dear Arjuna. Bhagavan is telling to Arjuna. But Arjuna did not ask any question. Bhagavan is just reiterating because a good teacher reiterates. A good teacher repeats. Repetition is the name of the game. What to tell? That technique which is used in Bhagavad Gita, we use in Chinmay Vidyalaya. In form 4, the whole syllabus is finished. In form 5, only repetition. I say the technique was Bhagavan using it through Bhagavad Gita. Repetition. Rama Ratate Ratate. Iti Devu Maria. Repeating the name of Rama. If you don't repeat, it goes in one hand, goes out the other. The repetition stays inside. Param Bhuja means again. Once more, again, Bhagavan is telling the same. Same knowledge. Param. Param means Desha Kala Vastu Parichheda Shunyam Atishyam Niratishyam. Param. This is, means that which is in, in no way uh, restricted by place, time, and object. They call Param. That Param is called Brahman. So the knowledge of a Brahman, knowledge of the absolute reality, that they call it Param Jnana. So he says, yeah, that Param Jnana, Uttamam means the highest knowledge. The words in Sanskrit is not like English, right? Sanskrit sentences, if you are reading those verses on the board there, then I have to tell you very quickly, Sanskrit sentences are not like Sanskrit lines, are not like English lines. In English, if you say, the dog jumped over the cat, right? The dog jumped over the cat. You cannot switch those words in an English sentence. Those words have to be right there. The dog jumped over the cat. So you switch cat and dog. The, the meaning of the sentence will, will change, isn't it? You switch those two words. But in Sanskrit you could switch. In Sanskrit you could switch any word you want and put it anywhere and nothing will change. What a language. What a language. Any word can come anywhere in the life. And the meaning will be exactly the same. So now I, the words are there everywhere in those lines. I went to you. That, that this language is so wonderful. Parambuya Prabhupada. Prabhupada means I will tell. I will tell. Bhuya again. Again I will tell. Param Yam. Since Param goes with Yam, she's way down in the energy line. Second line, and they say, Jnana Uttama, which is the highest of all knowledge. Bhagavan says, I am telling you now in this 14th chapter. I am telling you, highest of all knowledge. Yes, Jnana Uttama. So, and the next two lines, very nicely, two, three lines. The Prayojana of Shastras. The Prayojana of Shastra means everything which is done in this world has to be purposeful. Everything which a human being does has to be purposeful. We have to, be do, it. We have to do it for some reason, some purpose. So he says, yes, Nyatva, having known this knowledge, having known this knowledge, and if you jump down the right chapter in two lines, Sarve Api Nagupachayate in the next verse. The person will not be born in this world again. So the purpose of knowledge, the prayojana of Nyan, knowledge, is Vedanta, Sanskrit, and uh, Upanishad. The purpose is to come out from the cycle of birth and death. And he says, he says, Munayaha Sarve Param says, He says, the Rishis, they are the ones who, this is in verse number one now. The Rishis, they are the ones who acquired this knowledge and they came out from the cycle of birth and death. Otherwise, we are born and again we die. And we are born and we die. And we are born and we die. And how many times? In the fourth chapter, Bhagavan tells to Arjuna, countless times. We are born in this world to die only. We are born only to die. The moment we are born, our destiny is from the womb to the tomb. We go there. 
waiting to go in the well, of course by hindu you have to do the destiny water for the creek you might be born and nobody likes birth and nobody likes death also that's why when he's born he cries if he loved the birth when he's born he will laugh <laughs> I came back to this world, but nobody is born like that. I laugh when I am born. He cries for his dear life. And when it's time to die, again nobody likes it. Oh God. People will say, I'm ready to go. But when Yamaraj comes, Yamaraj is the Lord of Death. So we don't like those two things, but those two things we subject ourselves to because we don't seek this knowledge. That is the idea. In Bhagavad Gita, the teaching is through this knowledge only. Yet Jnyatva Punade. Sarayami na upachayate pralaye cha pralaye na pitanticha. So he says, the Munis and the Rishis, see, everything which is done in the world, we always have to have some example. Munis and Rishis and all, they are the ones who have gone through this knowledge and imbibed this knowledge, made this knowledge part of them, and they have come out from the cycle of birth and they are this and they are the ones who stand testimony. And let me tell you something, in this religion, in this religion of Sanatana Dharma, if you want any credible testimony for anything, in this world, it is to be found in this religion. Any credible testimony. But let me tell you the culture and the style of the Rishis. It is like this. Rishis, first of all, had no intention to start any religion. The first thing. The Rishi will sit down and he will go into deep meditation and go into samadhi and he will experience the truth, the absolute reality behind the universe, he becomes one with it. And after he opens his eyes, he sees the world anew. He sees the oneness of the universe. And so he sees the oneness means there is only one thing in the universe. I am part and parcel of that one thing. And that, unit, that Rishi discovers what is called as contentment. I just told you in the beginning, a contented person wants Nothing. So the Rishi, the Rishi will sit there uh, and go about his business, whatever he's doing. Bhagavan Shankaracharya describes such a person in Bhajan Bhavanam Si. How he describe? Yoga Dhova, Bhola Dhova, Sangha Who is reveling in, in Brahman only, the absolute reality? He says, Yoga, Dova, Bhogar, Dova, whether he is engaged in this thing, that thing, in Yoga or Bhogar, doesn't matter what he is engaged in. Nandati, 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 but he is all the time reveling only. Those people are the best testimonials to truth because they had no interest in anything or starting any religion or getting any disciple or anything. He wishes he is reveling in truth. Some disciple will come and he will say, Oh great Rishi, please teach me. The Rishi will say, Okay, sit. He will teach him. Then when he finished teaching, Okay, get lost from here now. This fellow will go. In today's modern world, and what came after in the last 3000 years, what came, you know, this fellow, he discovered something. He, hey, come, let me teach you. Teaches go and bring some more. You want to get the numbers? That means there is some deficiency, there is something lacking, there is no contentment. A true uh, discoverer of the truth is so contented he wants nothing. 
He receives, wants nothing and asks nothing. He is free. Any devotee comes and he wants something and he can give. He gives and says, go from here. So if that person who wants nothing, who is absolutely contented, if he tells something, why would he ever tell something which is not true? Because he, he has nothing to gain from anything. So why do you tell one truth? Whatever he tells, it will be the absolute truth only. He's not looking for anything from anybody in this world. This is a tradition. Eh? The Rishi tradition is that Rishi doesn't look for anything from, from anybody. So, those Rishis, he says, they're Munayaha, they're called Muni. Muni in plural is Munayaha. You may not have known that. Muni, Muni, what do you know? Muni Rishi is with you, Muni is a Rishi. Say it is. So it's plural is Munayaha, they're called. In the first verse. So the way Param says, Dim, it's a ha, it's a ha. From here, in this, from this worldly existence, how many from this worldly existence? From this worldly existence, they have gone to the supreme state and they have come from the cycle of birth and death. Inamyam Vashitya, Mama Sadhana Madhuta. And those people who take record, recourse to this knowledge, which I am giving you today again, Arjuna, this, those people who take recourse to this, to this knowledge and and come to my state, come to identify with me, the one in reality behind this entire universe, Sadhya B, now Pajayate, even at the time of the next manifestation, they, are, they don't get manifested. So they merge into the absolute reality. Pralaya, not yet a teacher. And when there's dissolution of this universe also, such people never get disturbed or perturbed. This is the idea which is now in the beginning of this 14th chapter. Now, this is about one topic. Now we want to Mama Yonir Mahatma. How exactly this universe exists, how it is formed. Now, there is one more very important limitation which we have to be cognizant of, and that is the limitation of language. Because the language falls in the, parameter, in the parameters of time, isn't it? So language has to talk about past, present, and future. Because it, language also has a beginning, a middle, and an end. But I'm saying a sentence, the sentence has a beginning, it has a middle, and has an end. So language is, is limited by time and space and all of these types of things. So language limitation has to be, we have to be cognizant of the limitation of language as we proceed in the next, in the next verses. Because it is going to now give a very, very profound uh, concept of the cosmology, the existence of the cosmos, which is cast in, the, in words, and words are cast in time. But the, the person who is studying it will have to think outside of time. That is the limitation of the language, you see. Though it is cast in time, we have to think outside time. We will talk more about this tomorrow. Very, very esoteric.